Wondering how to leverage business retreats to grow your revenue? Running high-end retreats can be a lucrative and fantastic way to build your business. Now take it from someone who's run retreats before, it can also be a massive time, money and energy suck if you're not clear about the reality of running events. So in this episode, we invite our amazing friend Natasha Denman, entrepreneur, mum and superwoman to share how she has been able to use retreat to increase her revenue. Natasha also shares her journey from being a PT to coach, multiple time published author and a seven figure business owner. No fluff, just the good stuff. Keep listening. Welcome to Founders Connect Podcast. We help lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Did you know that approximately 45% of marriages end up in divorce and 65% of all startups fail due to founder conflicts? Well, we're here to change that. Each week, we bring you an inspiring guest and practical tips to help you with business, relationships, and sustainable living. Now, let the fun begin! Hi, I'm Cindy Pham. And I'm Anthony Chansomuth. And we're from Founders Founders Connect. Connect. Today, we have our beautiful friend, Natasha Denman, who's the ultimate lady. 48-hour author. Let me get that right. Um, she's a professional speaker, highly sought after, coach and mentor, 10-time published author now with the new book and creator of the game-changing business model, The Ultimate 48-Hour Author. She's helped over 300 solopreneurs become first-time published authors in just five years in Australia, USA, and the UAE. And in eight short years in business, Natasha has been nominated for Telstra Business Woman of the Year twice and was a finalist in Oz Mumpreneur of the year in product innovation. And, I mean, if that's not enough. Nat also runs a multiple seven-figure business with her husband, Stuart, and three children traveling the world, spreading her message and helping small business thrive. And bonus tip for you, she also was a wonderful guest at our wedding. Uh, one of our amazing <laughs> exactly. friends. <laughs> best one. And we didn't tell you on the night, Nat, but you got the best prize or best dancer that night because you rocked it. Ah. Yeah. But do you remember also took over the DJing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just multi-talented. <laughs> we got it. So today we're going to talk about how to skyrocket your revenue running high-end retreats. And this is really what your new book is all about. Yeah. There it is. It's yeah. called Fully Booked Retreats, Your Guide for Explosive Business Growth. And this is book number 10. Before we get into the book, let's talk about the journey and a bit about you just as an individual. So Cindy, your question. So on the scale of one to 10, how weird are you? Three. I actually don't think I'm weird. I oh, think I'm wow. Like, I actually think I'm fairly normal, but I think I'm very obsessed. Okay. So not weird, but obsessed. Not weird, but obsessed. Not weird, but obsessed. Uh, obsessed. Mm, okay. Obsessed could- about my passion because <laughs> if you have an obsession about what you love doing, I don't think it's sustainable and um, because people see me running around and doing all the things that I do and writing all the books and helping all the people and they go, I don't know how you have the energy. And I said, I don't think you'd have the energy unless you had obsession around what you do. So I don't think I'm actually a weird person. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Well, it's all, Maybe it's subjective. the level of obsession. Yeah. No, I love that. Obsession, just awesome. Okay. I think I know the answer to this, but if you had all the time and money in the world, what would you be doing? Ah, I still the same thing because I find my business very entertaining and whenever I'm on holidays and right now I'm entering a period of two months of pretty much I could sit around and do nothing and travel or just be by my pool with my kids. However, towards the end of this period of the summer break, I start to get really, really, really bored and like I just want to get back on the road. I want to go with people. I want to do my events. I want to have a purpose and tasks to complete. I've got, I guess, a very strong achiever pattern within me. So unless I feel I've achieved something rather than just sitting around maybe reading books and all that, which again, gets old. Like, you know, most people are looking for this beach lifestyle, or laptop lifestyle, all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't think that is what I would want or would make me happy. I think people who do nothing get really depressed. I think exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because there's a lot of you know stuff out right now around mental health. And I was reading about the entrepreneur personality type and you know something that we've had to deal with 
you know, our relationship was understanding, like, it's very hard for me as an entrepreneur to switch off, right? Like, mm-hmm. like because like what you say, when you're obsessed about your thing, right? Yes. Like, you just want to do that thing. Like you don't think about, oh, you know, it doesn't drain energy from you. It gives you energy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what's your sort of take on that? And do you schedule time off? How do you do self-care? I know you've got your flow yoga shirt on right now. Tell us let's, about that. Like what's your... Let's flow. <laughs> yeah, how, how do you find balance? Does work-life balance exist for you? Yeah, it totally does. I mean, already 2019 is scheduled in my planner. And the very first thing I block off is all my time off. And I put a big blue line through it. And that's time when I will not schedule any events or speaking gigs or anything. That time is just not even, doesn't exist in the year (laughs) as far as I'm concerned. And we'll pack up the family in the middle of winter. Usually May, June would go uh, when it's really freezing in Melbourne. We'll go somewhere hot like Thailand or Southeast Asia or Europe or America. We've been the last couple of years in that big break. As I said, summer holidays now, you know, that's kind of forced upon you that kind of break because... um, I guess it's nice over Christmas to just be with family and then go on a little road trip with the kids. So we take about four months off a year, okay? But when it's on, it's on. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a daily balance thing. Like Monday through to Thursday, I'm pretty much work mode. Friday through to Sunday, I'm off. I never work Fridays. I can pick up a phone call or an email here and there, but I will not schedule meetings again, go to events and things like that. So yeah, there is. I mean, there's plenty of time. I always say I have a ton of time. And now I've just hired a personal assistant who's going to be sitting here next to me next I've year. Yes. I know. I've set up this office, got two computers, everything. I just uh, made the offer yesterday to her and she'll be taking across some of my work because something you guys don't know is that has happened and I'll reveal it to you probably first on this interview. My my secret community of authors know because I announced it to them. But about eight weeks ago, we actually launched and started our own publishing company. Oh, wow. Fantastic. I know. And on the back, I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the video, but right here on that is called Ultimate World Publishing. Okay, so this was the first book published by my new publishing company. So I did this start to finish, whereas we used to outsource this to Mm. uh, suppliers for the last five years. And I decided when I said, I'll give this a go myself. I know so much about this world. Why am I not doing this myself fully in-house? And so therefore, I did my number crunching and I go, you know what? I'm crazy not to do this myself and I can have then... A repetitive business from my clients who finished my big program. Now, when they want to write book two, three, four, all of a sudden I'm able to service that. And so that's why I hired a PA because she will be able to do that. I'm not giving myself more work. I'm just working smarter and uh, I guess growing the team. To me, that's a next logical step for what you do because that's just mean. Yeah. We see this with Woolies and they sort of start off with certain products and groceries, then they end up owning the farms that produce yeah. products and yeah. so the ability to scale and business models and all these sort of things. So I think that's a fantastic move for you and definitely for your authors as well. That's just yeah. fantastic. Now, for people who don't know what the business is, so let's explain what is Ultimate 48 Hour Author and now publishing, you know, what's it, what's it called? Something World? Uh, Ultimate <laughs> World Publishing. Oh, so World got, publishing. Okay. I actually rebranded also a couple of weeks ago and it's the same logo so that they both align. Because what we wanted to do is put the Ultimate World Publishing on the back of the books rather than 48 Hour Author, mm-hmm. which can have a perception from those that don't know it that perhaps, oh, this book was done super quickly and maybe it's not good quality, which is not true, right? But we thought let's separate the publishing side of it from the actual retreat. So we're talking about also fully booked retreats. So Ultimate 48 Hour Author is a high-end retreat where people get taken care of from start to finish and are able to execute the content of their book within those 48 hours. Of course, beyond that comes a process of transcription, cleanup, editing, layout, all of that takes about three months after the retreat. However, the author doesn't need to be worried about anything but executing their expertise during the retreat and then we take care of everything else. So it's an end-to-end. So yes, there's a high-cost um of the people that we need to hire within the process to execute this, but we project manage it. So therefore, those super busy people or people doing it for the very first time, writing their very first book, which is what I would say 98% of our clientele are, are very 
you know, don't have enough education around how to do it, how to structure it, how to market themselves, promote it, and we answer all of those questions because they have a lot of fear. First of all, they have their minds that they have to get through. Mm. Then once I help them get over themselves, I help them with the process and structure and publishing and all that sort of stuff. So it's really been like a model that has evolved and grown over these five years and refined and brought in more systems. And it has even become faster than what it used to be, Mm. you know, because I'm able to figure out where maybe we were wasting time and where we can do things better. So what was retreat one to retreat 23 coming up this weekend is amazing and I just love it I just I can't think of anything it kind of fulfills all your needs for like yes you get to do your business your career but you get to have an amazing social experience as well and connect with like-minded people as well so it's like and all of these people then beyond their program are in our secret Facebook community which is now 300 people and these are high quality individuals because no one invests into this high-end program that's not serious about their success or their life so it's just like going um, fire within there to support the collaborations, the masterminding and all that. That's amazing. Just the whole ecosystem that you've created, you know, in the last yeah. eight years. Can you take us back to, I heard on an interview that you were on, that you shared when you wrote the first book that you put out, that you were, I think you were in personal training or you were a coach at the time and you had Definitely. your first client only. And so, yeah. so a big block around, you mentioned mindset, a big block around writing a book is maybe I'm not credible enough or I don't have the seven figure business. So I can't really go out there and, and talk about it because, you know, then I'll be like faking till I make it and, and it's not congruent. So tell us about that story, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, sure. So the first book was called The Seven Ultimate Secrets to Weight Loss. And when I decided to write it, I did have only one paying client, which took me five months to get from the time I started the business. So with one paying client, someone suggested once they heard me talk about what I was passionate about and the fact that I have a degree in psychology and psychophysiology and I had completed all my coaching qualifications and I had studied and read and experienced a lot of personal development the previous decade. So when this person heard about how I spoke about my passion, he said, well, Nat, you should write a book. It would be your business card on steroids, right? (laughs) And I was like, and the minute he said that, the penny dropped. Not many times in life does the penny drop, but that was for me. And I said, you know what? I think you're right. I'm going to write a book. (laughs) (laughs) And I like to set goals. That was December coming up eight years ago. January that year, um, seven months into the business, I set a 90-day goal that I was going to write 90 pages in Word and said to myself, who can't write a page a day, you know? Everyone can do a page a day. And I could touch type, so I said that would be super fast. (laughs) But I set up two two two-hour writing sessions in my planner because I thought I'm not going to sit write a page a day. I'll go for seven pages in a week, but I'll do it over blocks of two hours. And certainly sticking to that, one of my strengths is to be very consistent. I um, finished it in 80 days and then went about looking for who can help me self-publish. Of course, went through all of these crappy experiences that I now can talk about and warn people about when they're looking for for people to help them publish. Because I'm a big believer to give all control to the author beyond the publishing process, whereas a lot of publishers out there are, I want to sell you lots of done-for-you marketing, uh, high-end packages which guarantee no results. They want to make a sack of money but not giving you printing rights to you, so you've got to keep buying from them and then you're paying five, six times the amount you should be paying. Mm. You know, So there's just like tricky ways that people get you in the door I've had a little bit less surprise, but then you lose control. So all of these things I went through, nevertheless, 13 months in, so six months it took for the writing and the publishing, I was giving birth to baby number two. Two days before that, book number one came and I was like, oh my God, okay, I either have to make this work with a newborn baby or I have to go back to my day job because I never quit my day job up until I had to go on maternity leave with that baby. And certainly the next 90 days was a big change because people saw me with the book standing up saying, hey, this is who I am. And they started saying, would you speak at my chiropractic clinic? Because again, health and weight loss. Mm -hmm. I was collaborating with people with chiropractors, osteos, personal training studios. And that's where I would go and talk about mindset. And that's where people would come and become my clients. And my books were full in 90 days. I don't know how in between all the breastfeeding, but it was really amazing. And one thing, I guess, a tip I would share, just please don't think just because you write a book, it's going to be like magical, like the way I've explained it. There's a a lot of pre 
things that I did for the previous 13 months before the book came out, I made it a rule of thumb to go out networking twice a week. Mm. Okay. So what that meant that after having networked twice a week for 13 months, I had attended over 110 events, let's say. And after 110 events, you think a few people got to know me really well, yeah? <laughs> because, of course, I, I repeatedly turn up to the same places, sometimes random ones, but I build relationships, which means when the book came out, these are the guys that initially gave me opportunities and wanted to do more work with me or refer to me and all that. So sometimes people, it's like, if you're an unknown and you just publish, you're still not going to really make a big headway in a massive way to, as it happened to me unless you actually really focus on building a network. And that's just so important, especially now in a time of the Facebooks and Instagram. Yeah. And everyone's like trying to avoid going to meet people in real life. It's kind of like, well, let's just do all this lead okay. online. And I'm glad you're sharing that because I feel we're doing the same thing. We're going up to the Gold Coast tomorrow and we've actually like set up an impromptu meetup on Eventbrite. Nice. And we're just like, let's meet people because you've got to yes. build connections. And I think we're actually, as humans, craving the connection because it is so much people staring at their phones and you know iPads and whatnot, right? Yeah. You are listening to the Founders Connect podcast, helping lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Now back to the show. What's your favorite quote, Natasha? Yeah, I have one. And actually, I put it in my planner. I create this planner every year. And let me just pull it out so I can get it the right way around because it's a little bit. So this is the planners I've been creating for the last few years. All right, here we go. It's big, written a big quote here. Oh, <laughs> Entrepreneurs wow. live a few years of their life like most people won't, so they can live the rest of their lives like most people can't. Oh, great one. There you go. I love that one. I needed to read it because I always get it the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go then from, okay, book number one is out and then when did the first retreat come in and, and when did you learn the power oh, of the retreat? It wasn't until three and a half years later from the first, oh no, I guess two and a half years after the first book because the first book came out 13 months in. So retreat one was October 2013, business started May 2010. So three and a half years after I started was the first retreat. However, in those first three and a half years, I did a lot of events. Events whereby, I mean, I think I met you in those first three and a half years, Am, um, where you may have popped into that place in Sydney, that pub I used to do yes. my events. <laughs> uh, you know, I used to figure out ways. And those events were very small, five, 10 people, 12 at the most. I mean, I didn't have money to put into Facebook ads and, um, you know, I just hustled any way I could. Who knew a person that might be interested in this event? And I started doing my national tours without any paid advertising and without too much of a network in any of these cities, aside from what I tried to build over social media. And so did lots of events, 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 events which is the perfect way to continue generating business and clients for your business because people meet you. That's where they build the trust relationship and boom, it happens. Rather than on social, you've got to see someone a 50 million times in order for them to be ready to buy it from you. Mm. I had a lady in my event um, two weeks ago who signed up for my retreat, but she told me I've been following you on social for three years, okay? And I've been kind of interested in your stuff and finally she's become a client. So on social, you've got to be like really consistent for a long time, yeah. right, which is a lot harder. But in real life, you know, you can literally put on an event and, of course, promote it and get people in there, do a great job, and someone will generally 10% of the people there will end up doing something with you if you did a, an okay job and then you'll get some clients. That's why when people say, what would you do if you started over again? I just go start, get out networking, go with people. It's the fastest way when you're new to get something off the ground. Yeah, not just hang on and hide away. But that's one of my pet hates is like the people hide away. They're so, so busy, but they're just crawling. Yeah, mm. and doing nothing really useful. So the idea for the first retreat was I really wanted to, why did I want to do retreats? Because I wanted to trick people into following through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, There's so many people um, go to seminars, go to educational stuff, invest in business coaches, do all of this stuff. So much money is being invested, but the reality is only 3% of them ever follow through and get a return on investment. After licensing my weight loss brand and selling my intellectual property, which was very successful, that was my first one to many kind of uh, setup, I was seeing that decline of people following through and doing the work. And I was feeling really disheartened because I go, well, they invested thousands of dollars to have this IP. They're really hot and heavy and excited the first three or four months. And then slowly they stopped 
you know, disappearing and they flushed the money down the toilet, right? And I knew it wasn't my fault because I was providing more than enough support, but you can take a horse to what you can't make him drink, right? Yep. So when I decided to admit the ultimate footy at all, I go, how can I make people follow? How can I get as close to the 100% follow through and a result that is going to make me feel happy, but make them feel happy and all of that? And so I started thinking to myself, and of course I had done a book over a weekend myself. That's why I had the Ninja Couch Marketing book was the one that was, I was the first guinea pig to take myself away on a weekend. And then I'll go, okay, I can reverse engineer this and then teach it to others. Then I go, okay, so if they were going to follow through, let's lock them down and make them do it over a weekend so everything is done. And then the other thing I go, but I need to do more than that because if I just mentor them, again, they've got to look for their publishers, got to look for designers, layout, blah, 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 photography. And then I thought, okay, I think I need to include everything. I said, this is going to be an expensive exercise, but I need to source what these things are going to cost me, accommodation, meals, transfers from the airport, publishers, layout people, designers, photographers, everything. And so I did, I come up with a price point and I um, announced it. Of course, everyone that knew me or I uh, talked to when I started to promote it said, have you done this before? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like, well, I have done it on my Ninja book and that's all the proof that I said. So the first group were really people who already loved me, trusted me, knew me, my either ongoing business mentoring clients or people from networking that had known about the minute those guys had their books in hand three or four months after their retreat which was March 2014 it was like oh everyone was interested it's like oh my god you know that worked Uh, I want to come and And the next three or four retreats was quite easy you know to fill them and to execute them it was like oh I want to this is the best but then we hit a point where they declined in numbers so we had a couple of retreats where they had five and five my goal was to have 10 authors four times a year yeah and then it declined to find and I said, oh, you know, we're really like scrambling now and what are we going to do? And I hired a mentor at the time and said, Nat, if you want to scale, you really need to start Facebook advertising mm. and you need to get into it. You need to keep getting in front of now. You've exhausted your warm network because we do exhaust our warm network. You can only build so many warm relationships at a time. There's only one of us, right? Yeah. No one invests in high end just because they've seen you or they've seen it on your website. You know what I mean? And so I did and it was like, oh, so scary because Stuart just flashed up a figure that we had spent $228,000 on fa- in Facebook since we started, mm. like doing advertising. And however, he also said we've got 20 times ROI on that, which is yeah. true, you know. But it was just like interesting to see the figure he posted. Us. I said, I can't believe you're sharing like usually Stuart's very secretive, but I can't believe that he actually shared a dollar figure of our Facebook spend. I was just thought it was very uncharacteristic of him, but that's okay. I said, okay, I'm open book. I uh, said, because I would tell anyone everything about what's going on. Anyway, so yeah, so once we started doing Facebook ads, it's been up and down because the algorithms change. Sometimes certain things work. You've got to keep working it. And that's what Stuart's really biggest role in the business is 10 hours of his week is spent managing the Facebook ads team as well as creating new content and looking and understanding the numbers in the back end of the ads account, right? And if you don't do that, you could be flushing a lot of money down the toilet. So now this year, we've had such amazing consistency throughout. Our rooms are now up to 35, 40 people. It's probably capacity for what we do. Maybe we need to do multiple events in a city if there's a lot of demand. But now we've got two national tours, which then fill our four retreats, which are now cranked up to 20 authors per retreat. So we're helping about 80 to 100 authors a year now. Like it has scaled up a lot, as you said, multiple seven figures, you know, and uh, mum came part of the team. We hired our mum. Oh, wow. Full time. Yeah. Well, yes, um, she's full time being paid. <laughs> but she, she gets her pay every Thursday. But mum's in charge of coming in to be with the kids whenever we need to jump on a plane because I was doing all my interstate stuff alone and missing out on opportunities and sales unless you can talk to people immediately. So then we started, did a trial last year in September and uh, we saw like we had a $550,000 a month uh, and I was like, whoa, with Stuart. <laughs> and I said, that's it. We need to figure out how to get you more with me. And so this year in January, mum, we stop cleaning and come work for us and kind of 80% retire 
And so she comes and lives in with the kids when we have to do that. And she does my bookkeeping. And poor woman, I've, I'm about to change on her the book and the our systems. We've changed her on a really old system to a new one, but now I need to change to another one because that one doesn't have payroll. So uh-huh. like she three accounting systems. <laughs> uh, she's, She's like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're helping her grow her, uh, you know. Yeah. I know I so just imagine you can start doing this for other people because I would have trained you up in all these systems and I said, don't worry, I'm alongside you. And, yeah, and she does the postage. So whenever someone buys a physical book from us or a planner, I'll send, my virtual assistant will send her the details. She'll go pack it up, put it in the mail. So she needs the stimulation. Otherwise, as you said, you know, sitting around could yeah. be very dangerous. <laughs> yes, yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, like, you did the first retreat. Now, one of the chapters, I think it's chapter two in your book, you've got sales funnel design that converts. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Like what's, I guess, is getting into a bit of a nitty-gritty now around retreat building, but. Even let's start with the first chapter, which is magnetic. So yeah. how do you decide what that offer is and how do you even think about like what should the retreat be? With retreats, you need to look at yourself and what is it that other people see in you that they want for themselves. So everything I've done on this journey, and I think all entrepreneurs, which is most of the people who probably follow you guys and listen to this, have achieved something within their life that they're great at. Okay. And everything that I've done and every book I've written is because I've achieved certain success at it. And now I'm here at this, not an end point, but I can look back and go, well, what did I do? And how did I reach that outcome? Why I wrote this book was because so many people go, oh, Nat, I want to do what you're doing. I just want to hold retreats. And they see me promoting the weekend and see the pictures. However, I say, okay, well, are you willing to work the other you know, six heavy duty months out of the year to make it happen because we worked out it five to six months of hard work to fill our retreats because it's two national tours that last, let's say, for two to two and a half months. And it's pretty intense because you've got to have, um, you know, the funnel. So this question is kind of like blends in chapter one and two, whereby you cannot sell someone into a high-end retreat just from them probably watching you on social media. It depends because our retreat is $20,000, you know, at this point of the interview might be more next time people listen to it. But you need to build a really high value offer that uh, in the eyes of your potential participant or client, it's going to be 10, 20 times worth saving them time, money, you know, giving them shortcuts, giving them a product at the end if that's the way, you know, your retreat's going to be designed. It depends. Sometimes if it's just education and transformation in a way, maybe you're not going to end up charging 20 grand, right? Because within ours, there's, you know, 50% of costs. You can't go, oh, yeah, 20 grand, that's all profit. It's not because, you know, we've worked out it takes us about $2,000 of advertising money to find one client, right? Then you put on the money of the publishing and you put on the money accommodation meals. So you really got a number crunch correctly to price it because I actually had it underpriced the first three or four retreats. It was underpriced because I didn't realize how much effort it would take me to continue filling them. I didn't realize that it was like I didn't plan even the advertising money in my head. I just thought, oh, yeah, I'll just find the people for free, but it's not true. There's time and effort and now Facebook ads and all that kind of stuff. So magnetic offer, please stay away from fluffy. So many people are trying to sell empowerment, enlightenment, Come back to you, your true you. I don't know. The, yeah, the, yeah. Find your balance. <laughs> find your balance. Too. How can you make it? You could sell, find your balance, but how can you, you know, rephrase it? I always love putting numbers around things. Can you give people something, you know, they're going to achieve in the next 90 days? Can you give them, you know, 48 hour of that? I wrote a book, Thousand Days to Million Dollar Coaching Business from Home. Obviously, Seven Ultimate Secrets. So I love putting a number to it. It almost makes it feel systematic. So you don't have to do it for everything, but it makes it feel systematic. And then the funnel, it doesn't have to be too complicated, but if you can add some kind of a face-to-face component to the top of your funnel, which is my half-day workshop, which we do 30. So we do 35 half-day workshops to fill four retreats, okay? So seven or eight half-day workshops fill one retreat. Mm. Because sometimes people think I just want one or two off the top of the funnel and then I'll get my people for the retreat, but it's not true. You know, some will convert more, some will convert less, some will convert nothing. 
Yeah? yeah. You know, you'll get some zeros throughout the year. So can you take us through the journey of launching in the US and in the UAE? Because that was interesting oh. that you do that, right? And yeah, what were some of the lessons and insights from that? You are listening to the Founders Connect podcast, helping lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Now back to the show. Going to a new country, you're like a um, fresh new baby that nobody knows. <laughs> and you go into a culture that you think it's similar, especially with the US, you think, oh, they're pretty similar to Aussies. No, they're not. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not very similar. But having been there twice now, of course, I know a little bit about their style and what they, how they behave in their decision making. So I'm able to work with it. But, oh, God, I was in tears the first after three events, half day events, because I was alone with someone who I had just met who was my crew person on the road. I kind of hired him by a distance. And I was just like in San Diego after we had done three half days. And I think we had no one sign up or someone signed up, but money wasn't in the bank yet for the deposit. I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? I was just like crying. I, we spent so much. You spent probably three times the amount to fill the rooms as compared to Australia. Thankfully, we realized that because of our, one of my authors that we would be eligible for the Export Development Marketing Grant. So right. that's called the EMG. And we got 20 grand back recently for our last couple of years of marketing overseas. That was great to kick back because we thought it was just completely on our own. In the end, launching the US, we can say we were ended up even. So we didn't lose money, which is great. I think most people say you lose money on your first couple of times going to another country. Uh, UAE was a different setup. I have a partner over there and he's on the ground. He knows the local laws, especially in the Dubai and Middle East, that there's so many laws. And that was a completely different experience. I felt like a rock star, okay, oh. because it was like, welcome me, pick me up from the airport, just took me around everywhere, set up everything. He's an events guy. Historically, he had a company. Therefore, the way he did it was really Dubai style, luxury mm. and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, when people were coming, like we were in front of this banner, taking lots of photos, and then I was in this massive ballroom delivering my half day, which was also a very different vibe to doing it in front of 30 or 40 people. Mm. Uh, but it was wonderful to have the support of someone. And I'm more than happy to share the profit share that we've worked out is fair with the Mustafa because he did so much work. He just... To me, it was just turn up and do it. And now we've been able to establish a remote partnership because I no longer want to travel long haul. Like for me, it was great, but it took me away too much and too exhausting in addition to everything I need to do for Australia. So my decision was to continue working remotely with my international clients. And so Mustafa finds the sales. I service them through some mentorship and we have a person who then follows accountability. So I guess another VA who is keeping them accountable so we're not overwhelmed by return messages and all that. And I've just signed up someone from the US who I've completely never met. I've never advertised in their state. I don't know how she found me, but she said, I'm interested in what you do. We got on a phone and two days ago she signed up and she's another remote. So they don't need to now be a retreat participant, yeah. they can go through. Now I have the option of just offering the publishing, right? Which yeah. means it's a much easier thing to sell on a call than a $20,000 program. Ideally, for all Australians that are listening to this, you don't want to not come to retreat. That's the ultimate experience and the ultimate way you're going to get the fastest result. Of All of these guys that are from international are going to be much slower. I think they're going to be taking 6 to 12 months. I know because I can see a few of them that we're working with right now. It's like just kind of they drag their legs because they're not within a group setting, yes. you know, being pushed around with the others, you know. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, because they push each other so much. I don't even need to do too much. They're like, oh, I did this and I completed this. And they're all like, okay, I better get onto it. And it's a whole different feeling. This is why I'm passionate about retreats is because you will get a result faster and with a group that is going through the same journey as you rather than, and sometimes people try to avoid it and try to sign up with me remotely, even if they're in Australia. And I say, as long as you expect that you're going to get this done in 12 months and not two or three, you know, and just know because you're going to be on your own and you're going to feel isolated. And you're going to, you know, have to be doing the tasks as I tell you. But again, you're not going to feel a sense of camaraderie and support from the group. So there you go. <laughs> no, I love that. It's just, yeah, it speaks a lot. I mean, I don't know 
I think you did do a book, which is all about the mindset and the challenges people have with even just getting yes. the book out or writing the book. Um, Shut up and write your first book, is that book. <laughs> that, literally, there you go. <laughs> that literally came out two months before this. So I've actually done two books in a very close period this year. And this one is actually shorter. And this is about twenty to 22,000 words. The other books I write about 40, and that's where I encourage my authors to do because this was actually written to hack the Amazon bestseller status. You know how a lot of people do the bestseller, you know, an Amazon number one bestseller. So I actually studied it this year and I wanted to experience it for myself. And I followed a particular person's, I guess, guidance. Mm. And it hit number one bestseller in four categories, even got to number 21 in the overall Kindle store. The whole Kindle oh, store. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I know. So it was just like, but to hit number one bestseller, it was easier than I thought. Mm. I said, oh, my God, this is just like I didn't even have to do too much. <laughs> and I got a new cover for it that has the stamp and everything, up, which I'm going to obviously when I print the next run. But I just wanted to do it because I do call a lot of bullshit on it. Yeah. And I just wanted to see how easy or hard it was. And it was just like I hardly even had to do anything for it. But it was a good thing. For me and my brand, it promoted a lot about what I did and um, a lot of people actually physically bought this book and luckily I did order a carton because it was never intended to be a physical book. <laughs> it's um, it's in the Kindle store and uh, actually I love it. They're actually saying I'll probably end up writing more twenty to 25,000 word books now because they're saying that it's short, sharp, to the point and just gives a lot of practical stuff and not a lot of fluff around it. Well, I think that's a, I mean, a solid point because people just, just, like you said at the beginning of this call, is a lot of fluff, right? And people just want, just give me the steps. And now audience is important because if we're talking Aussies, yes, Aussies just don't want all the crap. <laughs> it's just like, just tell me what to do, Nat. Don't, you know, yeah. mess around. Yeah. I don't have time, whatever it may be. So that's a good point. Okay, Cindy, you want to jump into relationships? <laughs> so what was the moment when you knew your partner was the one that you want um, to be with for life? I didn't know. I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where's Stu? <laughs> Let's ask him the question. Where's Stu? You no, know, I think I reached a point in my life where I thought, see, this is why I think I'm not weird and I think I'm so normal. I thought, okay, well, I'm about 28. Sounds like about the age that you should find someone that maybe if you do want to have children or something, you, you would do that. And I had come back from Europe and been single for a year because I forced myself to be single for a year because prior to that, I had two or three long-term relationships that lasted for two or three years each. And I would go through this whole honeymoon period and then I'd hit the end of it and get into like kind of just, I think I'm bored. I don't think I love him. Da, 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 da. And I didn't realize that actually life is about honeymoon routine mastery. Okay, so there's three stages. And you go through honeymoon and then you've got to stick out that routine period and all that sort of stuff and that it's not going to be those sparks that it used to be at the beginning. And then, of course, you get to a point where you've reached mastery and you continue to do an ex grow like that. But, yeah, so when I met Stuart after, they literally got off a plane and got on another plane to go to a, a conference in Queensland, not having slept for a week after my crazy European trip. And I met him at that. We were working for OPSM, both of us. And we were managers and that night, and I had checked him out before and thought he was cute, but this was like, okay, tonight's my night, you know? And, I'll wear, um, and I'll, I'm very good to manipulate any situation into my favour, and I got close to him through a past manager of mine, and we were like mucking around, having a few drinks, and of course, I made his team that night, and then we just kept talking over the phone between our stores for a little while, until we finally went on another date, and it was very slow to start with, and then, yeah, we just kept, um, he moved out of further away, to closer to me, to another place, which he shouldn't have, he should have just moved in with me because that place stayed empty for the whole time he had the lease. <laughs> <laughs> and we bought our first house after that, got pregnant and then got married. So we kind of bought a house, got pregnant and got married. And now we're 14 years together, 10 years married. Our oldest child just turned 10 a week ago. So that's how we count how long we've been married. It's like, how old is Judd? He's 10. I can tell how long we've been married because it. three months after getting married, Judd was born. Mm. So we, I was like six or seven months pregnant when I had my wedding. I'm just so fascinated by your thing with numbers because you've like, I know. If your business I is on your birthday or something. Like you've got <laughs> yes. these, yeah. This my business anniversary is 24th of May. Every year. Yeah. Actually, you know, another thing, we got married on the same date we kissed. So 2nd of August, 
is our 14 year anniversary together and 10 year wedding anniversary. It's interesting, isn't it? I just love numbers. That's why I also have been doing my own bookkeeping for all these years and teaching my mum. I actually really enjoy it. And I can remember, I like almost a photographic memory of my credit card numbers, my ABN, my, I don't need to, like, if someone needs to pay me, yeah, here's my BSB, here's my account number. I know all of that stuff and I don't need to look up stuff. Oh, <laughs> see? Great. That's a Definite natural... numbers purpose <laughs> person. <laughs> You've got a career in counting if you want that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, she should be bored to death. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> okay, Cindy. Yeah. What's the best tip for building sexual intimacy with your partner? Oh, especially as an entrepreneur. I think that's the sort of angle on that question. Yeah, holidays. Lots of holidays. Holidays. (laughs) I don't think it happens very much in the super busy period. I'm like in the zone. And when I can relax and have time off and, you know, be in holiday mode and relax, you know, I need to be rested. Otherwise, yeah. And also... um, Stuart snores a lot, so a lot of the time we don't want to sleep together, as in for sleeping. Hmm. So because I don't want to end up hating him because I've seen many relationships be ruined by someone who snores a lot because you just, they don't know they're doing it, they can't help it, yes. uh, but the other person is so frustrated and want to kill them. And I got to a point when we were having all of our kids that I needed to breastfeed and do all of that sort of stuff, and unless I was able to be all asleep, through the night and have the energy, I wouldn't be able to run my business. So we actually decided that that was okay, that actually we're so much more happier with it all and uh, the way it operates so that when everyone's rested, you don't get grumpy. You can imagine, you know, when you travel and you get so tired traveling, like, you know, and you get to a place and you start fighting. Well, we have a rule in the family, no one's allowed to fight within the first 24 hours of travel and arriving somewhere because we know that we're all tired and short-fused. And that's the same thing for everyday life. If you are not rested, you're going to fight, you're going to want to kill each other. And so therefore get your sleep, save your sleep, and that will give you your sexual intimacy and and love for each other. Otherwise, you know, you can anchor a lot of bad vibes between one another. This is why most people will then split up. Mm. Mm. Great advice there. Sleep. Beauty sleep. (laughs) That's right. As well. (laughs) So after 14 years, what's your sort of, Biggest lesson around communication with Stuart? Oh, uh, so he's a great listener and it's good because I can just blurt out some really heavy stuff at times and he just doesn't respond to it. He'll go away and think and ponder for 24, 48 hours and then he'll come back and make a decision or sometimes when I make the big moves in business like launching the publishing company was a big shock to him because he loves his comfort zone as well as telling him I wanted to hire a PA as it was like, again, change, you know, but he just, I said, don't say anything. I'm going to put it out there and go and think and ponder and make sense out of it in your own head. So I'm very happy and glad he's a great listener. I think that's one thing, one person in the relationship needs to be. I think it's not me. I just need to blur stuff out (laughs) and all that, but that's, I would say, and also doing personal development for both people doing personal development, because when you're able to see from a perspective of they weren't doing that to me or not coming from blame and not Mm. saying this person is a bad person in the relationship because they don't do X, Y, and Z and vice versa and acceptance. Like he always talks about the fact that sometimes when I'm on holidays, I will pick up my computer and like business mode for a couple of hours because I just enjoy it. He used to get frustrated when I did that in the early days and I would get frustrated when he came on board on the business after quitting his job that he wouldn't touch anything to do with business when we were away and I was like you know why doesn't he just do a little bit you know (laughs) and all that kind of stuff (laughs) and so nowadays we all both know when we are so we just kind of accept what the other person wants to do so acceptance and listening and uh, telling each other stuff that where maybe like I'm able to vent to him. So he's a really great vent buddy. So whenever something happens on social media, which, you know, a lot of things happen, you know, are said or done passively, aggressively by other people or, you know, you could get the trolls. And I'm always about protecting my reputation. There's so many times I could have spoken up and said stuff on social, but I just will not because I don't want it to backfire because once you get a bad thing put on you on the internet, it's very hard to make it go away. So I'll just go to Stuart and I'll just vent and I'll just scream. And then he sometimes he does it to me as well, you know, and then what we want to say and we'll just say it exactly how we want to say it. And then we'll just let it go. And 
I guess take the higher ground and I hate conflict and avoid it at all costs and that's why you'll never see me on social, you know, starting up, you know, an argument or fueling the fire or being passive aggressive towards other people. Yeah, I think we're just got better things to do with your time. So. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. You've got a business to run. <laughs> and, okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, last question. <laughs> really? No way. I mean, I know you want to keep Natasha on all day, but, you know, we've both got business to After do. all is said and done, what do you want yeah. to be remembered for, Natasha? I want to be remembered for being the hay house size of a publishing book mentoring company for entrepreneurs. Mm. Okay, so a few years ago, I said it to one of my mastermind participants. I go, I want Ultimate 40 Day Author to become the Hay House, but for entrepreneurs. So they do, like, you know, the um, what is personal Good. development, uh, mind, body, spirit, right? So they're known as the publishing house for that. And I want to be known as the publishing house or company or program for entrepreneurs around the world. And yeah, I think we're paving a path towards that. <laughs> you are. So let's assume that that's created. What does that yes. give you? A business that will be able to be then taken over and hopefully run by one or more of my children that will then protect their financial future. Again, back to numbers, uh, we're building up a big portfolio in terms of property and all that. Right now in our 40s is the time to build all of that up and then have that choice of what we want to do and don't want to do, say, in our 50s, Right. Yeah. And yeah. I'm all about thinking sooner rather than later about what does your financial security and life look like. I don't know. I guess I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in my 20s and it really made me think about am I investing just in do that's like he talks about or am I investing in assets and all that, you know, something that's going to build. And one of his things was shares, business, property and one other thing. I think there's four things he talks about. And so got properties obviously on the go and still building up with the business, you know, I guess a lot of goodwill and a lot of systems. I mean, this business can be on sold. I'd like to think that the authoring business is not going to be on sold rather than yeah, maybe perhaps uh, given onto one of the children mm. uh, because it's something that can't expire. I don't think it's a fad type of business. Like say social media might be around, it might not be, but authoring has been around for centuries. So perhaps maybe, yeah, giving them and then that will give them obviously the future because I guess for our children, it's very difficult when you see someone entering into the property market right now and what they need to do and put in to actually be part of it. And yeah, so that's it. And then of course, all my books will remain. They say books are your immortality projects. So I will yeah. become immortal through my books and oh. all my YouTube videos <laughs> and, and through, I guess, the legacy. Uh, you know, I think I'm, even if I died today or tomorrow, I've left a pretty big legacy. So I'm pretty stoked where and grateful what I've achieved. So that's, you know, yep, just you keep do. going. Just that's a super woman there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we just wanted to acknowledge you for just who you are and the way you show up and just your energy and everything you've done to support entrepreneurs, your family, your friends, and just one of the most, I guess, amazing people in our world, for sure. Definitely. And thank you for sharing your time with us today and your expertise as well. Thanks, Nat. My pleasure, you guys, and thank you. I guess I shared a lot more things in this interview that I normally haven't shared in other interviews. You know, it's been a little bit different, so thank you as well. Well, that was our goal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for everyone else, you want to check out this book, you want to flash it on the screen again one more time, Nat? Yes, so Fully Booked Retreats, Go and get it from Amazon on Kindle. It's a few dollars, probably the best way. If you physically want it, at the moment, I cannot sell it anywhere else but Amazon, but I do have copies in my garage. <laughs> you know, yeah, get them to connect with me via social or something, but we'll have it on the website in time, you know, and they can get it through there. But yeah, get the Kindle one first. And then if you want to write all over the insides of it, because there's so many practical steps, then, you know, you can sort, you can find me. Uh, you know what they say, if you can Google me and I come up, you'll find how to contact me. Yeah, and we'll provide links to all of these in our show notes as well. So make sure you check it out. Do connect with Nat. And uh, if you want to learn from someone who's a real practitioner and not a guru, uh, exactly. then this is the person. Okay, so everyone else, subscribe, share, and we'll see you guys all later. Okie dokie. That was our interview with our beautiful friend, Natasha Denman. And Cindy, what was your key takeaway? Well, I guess that in a partnership, there has to be the one person who is more a better listener 
than the other, isn't it? <laughs> I don't think it's about more being a better listener. It's about both practicing those listening skills, as we talk about in our relationship guide. But uh, you know, there's one person who's more like the talker, and the other person's a listener. You know? Yeah. That's what I took. But away. that's how Stuart is. And she's more the yaka, so she's just accepting who she is, and he accepts her for who she is. So basically, after all said and done, it seems like you need to accept the person for who they are. That's the most important. That's it. <laughs> see, I pulled that out of you, didn't I, darling? <laughs> yeah. See, you're better at reading between the lines and being direct. Of course. See. And you're better at wishy washy, isn't it? Hey, I tell stories. Exactly, which I need to learn how to story tell. There you go. We learn from each other. Um, <laughs> so, what did you learn, my darling? Well, for me, the book and everything that Tash is talking about in terms of using, you know, creating high end retreats to grow your business. Big part of that is that it's very difficult to sell a high end retreat just from social media alone or whatever it is you actually need. And I experienced this when I was putting together my Warrior Women Mastermind Retreat a couple of years ago, the hardest thing is to actually fill that room to get people there. And so you actually need to have, you can't go straight from like, here's a Facebook ad to buy my $2,000 event. Like it doesn't work that way. And we had to, when I went through it, it was actually three months of doing six months of monthly events, meetups to get, you know, we got five people there, right? So and for her, like you said, it takes her free to fill free weekend retreats. It takes her literally a year of ongoing half day or one day events to get people to then build the know, like, and trust factor and to really understand the benefits and then to be able to answer questions and then make the decision to come along. Right. And what she didn't really mention is even it's not just the one day event. She, at the one day event, it's actually half day, I think it's four hours. And then she invites you to have a conversation with her over the phone or face to face to really discuss whether or not the retreat is right for you before you invest $20,000 because that's a big investment, mm. right? And she doesn't accept everyone. She actually has a qualification process. So that's something that as we work through as consultants, as coaches, as VA, copywriter, whatever business you're in, that's very important to understand yep. that you're not just going to get someone to buy your $2,000, $5,000 package because they saw a post on LinkedIn. There's going to have to be multiple conversations along the way. Definitely, isn't it? A lot more work than you anticipate. Yeah, I think it's just that's reality check. We're having hashtag real talk now. Exactly. Like, that's what it takes to build a successful business. And another part that was really huge out of this conversation was that her commitment to when she started to two meetups per week, she went and attended two meetups that became not only am I attending two meetups but maybe I'm attending one I'm speaking at one and then she eventually sort of shifted from being just an attendee to becoming a speaker I know last year her goal was to do a hundred events last year and she actually hit that goal so that's, that's why my super woman. that's why she has a multi-million dollar business because of all that work mm, definitely and know your numbers I think you might like that one Yes, I definitely like that one. Definitely have to learn more from her. She knows her number off her head, <laughs> which is not where I am. So. <laughs> there you go. All right, well, we've enjoyed that. Do check out Natasha's books and her things on her website. You can go to www.writeabook.com.au. Writeabook.com.au. You'll find some free guides and some really cool things on there. She also runs a massive Facebook community, one of the largest Facebook groups on Facebook and one of the longest running ones, which is called Ultimate Business Support. If you check that out on Facebook, you'll see there are currently 14,677 members in that group and it's a very highly engaged group to be in. So that's it from us and as always, live confidently, passionately, and purposely. purposely. See you guys real soon. Are you thinking about leaving your job, taking control of your own destiny, and turning your passion and experience into a side hustle or full-time business? Well, check out our new corporate escape plan, PDF Guide. It's free and you will learn the top 10 challenges for new entrepreneurs and what you can do to overcome them. Just head over to foundersconnect.co forward slash escape to grab the free checklist now. Yeah, do it. In our next episode, we've got a special edition and we're going to talk about five lessons from our first year of marriage and business. So make sure you tune in for that one. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. 
And remember to live passionately, purposefully, and confidently. Till next time. <laughs>